Without further ado, let me introduce Professor Robert Merton. Uh, I have heard many times Bob being introduced. These introductions are very impressive and long, and uh, not surprisingly because uh, his contributions really are difficult to overstate. And it always starts by saying that here's someone who needs no introduction, and then there is a very long introduction. So I will try to change that a bit. Uh, you all know Bob. He was one of the founding fathers of our field, and he seems to be still at it. So Bob is going to talk about the retirement problem. I just want to point out that uh, in addition to many of his wonderful qualities and accomplishments, he is also an MIT alum, which is uh, uh, not the least uh, of his qualities. Thank you. Well, good morning, and I'm delighted to be here. And I'm delighted for the introduction, because now I don't have to say all of what I was going to say in the first 10 minutes. <laughs> so let's get to the thing. Now, I have to alert you. Whoops, did I already do it? Yeah, I think so. All right, I'm, I'm going to leave. These slides, you're going to get slide shock. You saw how neat and Leonid's were. You can see these are not. <laughs> not only can you, well, well, they made them better, uh, I think, but not, no, they're the ones. OK. <laughs> so uh, I just want to explain quickly that I'm not a slide person. And so these slides, most of whom I can't read, so you probably might have trouble from the back. You don't need them now. But they're there for you for later. If you hear something this morning that intrigues you, then you can have a copy. I've asked them to send you an electronic copy. And that can remind you what it was that you thought you were intrigued by. So except for a few pictures, don't pay too much attention to slides. And I might not even. I may forget to move them forward. OK, so to get right to it, because I'm looking at the time they've already taken it away. I can't do this, but I'll try. <laughs> What I'm here to talk to you about is an idea for innovation. It's a work that uh, I've done with Arun Malahari. He's a PhD from MIT, wrote a book on retirement a long time ago, not a long time ago, 15 years ago, with Franco Modiani, who was focused on this topic before the end of his life. And uh, it, what I want to show you is addressing a particular problem in the world, but a very big one. It's a global problem, and that's the financing of retirement. And there are many aspects to that. I'm not going to go through them. I'm going to target exactly one aspect. And that is that around the world, even where you have well-organized pension systems, say in Korea, which I'll use as a case study with the data today, I've done what you see here today for Singapore, various places in Asia, and we're just going down the list. So this is representative in terms of the data. And you know, Korea has a national pension service, big funded thing. However, it's not in great shape <laughs> for the long run. And right now, they have capped the benefits, capped them at 41% replacement ratio. Now, when we talk about pensions, we're talking about working and middle class people, primarily, at least in my mind. It's really tough to live the way you were living before you retired on a 41% replacement ratio. And that's just representative of good places. Some places are in much worse shape. OK? And very few are in great shape. And that's why we call it a crisis. So what are we trying to identify here? Recognize, like it or not, all of us, and in the future even more so, are going to have to take responsibility for your own retirement. You're going to have to do things. You're not going to just show up. They tell you when you retire, you're going to get the amount of money you need. That just isn't going to keep happening. So what I want to show you is a design which is an attempt to make this, to, to, to address this problem. We call it selfies. I won't take credit for the title or blame, OK? Which is a mouthful of words. I'll show you what a selfie is in a minute. But the basic idea is the following. In many parts of the world, even in the United States, but in many parts of the world, there are a large part of the population who are not even covered by any kind of pension, corporate, government, anything. But they still have the life cycle need for retirement funding. Now, this is not nudging or anything to get people to save or do it. This is to design an instrument that, if you want to do that, allows you to do it very efficiently. And in a typical, I think, MIT finance style, which has been very productive, many of you have used it, because it's designed based on finance principles, principles work everywhere in the world, then when you design this, it's not designed for the US 
or the UK or for Europe or South America or Asia. It's designed to be used any country in the world or any country that has a bond market, some kind of bond market, okay? So when you do this, there's the whole show. The second thing is we have to be, I want you to call attention to, the, 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 by the way, the design is very simple, simple to understand. That may not get someone tenure if they wrote it up, but it's wonderful if you're trying to get it done because people can understand it and if they understand it, they're more willing to implement it and there's not one new institution that has to, or regulation that has to be created to do it. Okay, so it's the background. I hope that tees you up for it. So let's, let's get started. I apologize, I'm gonna to try to move down as far as I can this way and that, but this is a wide, wide uh, audience. So what we're talking about here is, uh, well, let me get, uh, first of all, before I get into it, let's just agree on what is the goal. What do you mean to have a good retirement? We normally say, if I had to guess, and this isn't with me, a good retirement would be if you can sustain the standard of living that you had in the latter part of your work night, not the average from the time you were a student, but actually how you were living in the latter part of your work life. If you could sustain that for the rest of your life, that's a good retirement. And that's the goal we use in designing this instrument. People love pensions around the world. They say they, some people say they don't like annuities, of course they're the same thing, but they love pensions. Try taking them away from them and you'll see. And what is a pension? It's a stream of income in retirement to allow you to sustain your, some standard of living, we hope a good one, all right? And that's what we're going to try to reproduce in this new world where many of the people in the, are not even part of the official sector who are doing it for themselves, and everyone is going to have to do something, and maybe a lot, for their own benefit, okay? So that's the problem, if you like. Now let's see what we're offering as the solution, okay? Oh, oh, it's in front of me. I don't have to keep looking over there. <laughs> you can see I'm really techy. Those who have my handwritten notes, you'll, that's why I'm still there. Um, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna create a government bond. Now you all know what government bonds are almost in every country that has a bond market. Not very creative at all, all right? This bond is going to be designed to create payouts that mirror or parallel or close to what you would get from a pension. And then the simple idea is if you create a government bond that does that, if you find a good way, to, easy way to make them available to people at low cost, I don't mean subsidized, I just mean low transaction costs and so forth, then they have a way to manufacture what people want, which is a pension. That was our goal. Now one of the things I want to show you, and I'm worried about the time, is we got an extra couple of benefits from this we didn't plan on. That's what we were laser focused to solve. But what I hope to have time to show you at the end is we also address two other public policy problems with this one bond innovation. So you get three for one. And I thought that was kind of cool. And I want you to be focused on the detail, not the detail to memorize, but understand this is for people, let's say with a sub high school education to be able on their own to be able to do on a systematic basis, okay? So that's the challenge. All right, so they're designed to be, like, we could call them a pension bond if you like, and the uh, basic idea is, what do you do when you put money in a pension? Today you put your contribution in. What do you get from that? For the next 10, 20, 30, 40 years, nothing. Then what do you get? A stream of payments. For how long? We hope very long, okay? And then what? Nothing. People love those payments. Bond people in the room, you've got to erase yourself from thinking of this as a bond trader or something. We're not making it for you. We're making it for people directly. And I just want to remind you, people love this. They love their pensions. So in some sense, we don't have to sell them. We already have the customers. That always happens, by the way, when you're solution-based. Because if you start out looking for a solution for a problem, you know who is going to buy it. The people that you solve the problem for. 
That's one of the good parts of starting with a problem, finding a solution, and then building it, rather than building something and then trying to convince people they should want to have it. Nothing wrong with the second, but that's it. Okay, well this is background. So the two features to the bond are simply going to be, it's a government bond, all the full faith and credit and everything, so there's no hidden wrinkles. But we're going to change the payment stream from your standard five year, 10 year, 30 year coupon bond, tips or otherwise. Okay? And the other thing we're going to do is we're going to change what the payments are indexed to. Those are the two key, only two changes that we're going to make from a standard government bond. But think of it as having all the full faith and credit. It's not a pension or it's not Social Security where you can change the payments without going into default. This is a bond. This, if you don't pay, the issuer doesn't pay this, they're in the same sh shape as if you didn't pay on the U.S. full faith and credit treasury. Okay? So let's be clear. All right. And the idea, as I said, is designed so it works anywhere in the world. So let me explain what a selfie is. First of all, that's an acronym of sorts for Standard of Living Index Forward Starting Income Only Securities. Okay? And the best way I could do this is to say, you know, is to give you an example. So let's say we have a 26-year-old who's planning to retire at age 65. Plans that way, someone's told them that's when they're likely to retire. They have to know when they think they'll retire. Sorry, that's a piece of information they need, although they may ask for advice. If that's the case, that means they're going to retire in 2058. So what would be an example of using a selfie for this person. Well, we are gonna have a whole bunch of selfies on the shelf in the government to be issued or that you can buy. You could trade markets afterwards, but let's not get into that detail. And that instead of having maturity dates, you know, 10 year, 30 year, whatever, they're gonna have dates on them, but the dates are the dates when they start paying. So this person plans to retire in 2058. So they want, if they want a pension substitute, something that starts paying them in 2058, right? So then you tell them, when are you retiring? 2058, when you go to the shelf to get these, pick the 2058 off the shelf. It's just like you go in to buy a pair of shoes. What size shoe do you wear? Well, then you look at the size shoe, right? Same idea, and people can understand that, even with a sub high school education, I think, if they get that number. All right. What does a 2058 selfie do? It, you buy one now, it pays you nothing for 40 years or 39 years until when? 2058, and then it pays a stream of payments, let's say, and I'll come back to that, for 20 years or 25, you fix it. But it's the same for all selfies, okay? Say 20 or, tw let's, let's just say 20. Okay, I will tell you where you might want to pick that number, but that's a little ahead of the game. So you can picture that, no payments till 2058, then a stream of payments, and they stop. No longevity, nothing, it's, that's it. So it's just a government bond with different coupon payments and no principal at the end, all right? So that's the, the payment. Now, let me show you how you say this. One of the first questions, that's reasonable for this person to ask, say, all right, you've told me I should buy a 2058. As a goal, first, how many selfies am I going to need as a goal to have a good retirement? That's a reasonable question, right? What's my goal? How do I get there? Well, let's say each selfie pays $10 a year in each of its payment years, all right? So that's just the standard. We don't vary that. It pays 10. All right, let's say this person has a living on $50,000 a year. You can put any numbers you want in this, okay? You can do it in any currency. You know what I say? Well, for a good retirement, you ought to buy enough selfies to give you what you have now, what you're living on now. How do you do that calculation? Let me see. If I need 50,000 a year, and each selfie pays $10 a year, and I wanna have 50,000 a year in retirement, how many do I need? You divide 10 into 50,000, 5,000 selfies. Got it? So we already know our goal. Now, you know, we may not get to our goal, we know our goal. So for the moment, imagine 
that they, this person starts buying selfies now, and when they're age 40, 15 years from now, they ask themselves, how am I doing? Now, what would they see in the DC plan, you know, 401k, IRA, whatever? They would look at their account balance they'd have, if they're lucky, $322,730. Do they, or anyone else, including in this room, have any idea what that means at age 40 in terms of how close you are to what you need? Probably not. And on top of that, it would depend on what interest rates are, a whole host of things, which you'd even have to understand to be able to calculate, but which you'd least to do. What does this person do? Let's say he or she has gotten 3,000 selfies over the years. Well, let's contemplate if I don't buy any more selfies till I retire. What will I get? 30,000 a year. Well, we're all used to budgeting our income. I don't care where you are in the economic strata. For survival, you have to be able to take what comes in, your income, and how you decide to spend it. Car, clothes, food, selfies. Okay? So this is not asking people to undertake a task that they don't do all the time. And how do they relate to where they would be, where they are with their 3,000 selfies? They ask themselves, how would I feel living on 30,000 a year when I'm kind of at the moment 50? Now, some might say, hey, I'm getting rid of the kids. Maybe someone else, who knows? Maybe I don't need as much, okay? I'm trying to put a little levity in the room. No, 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 no intention to do anything improper, okay? Then fine, your choice. The important thing is you understand, that person understands the decision they're making because they can relate to the fact that they're living on 50 now, not some projection of what they'll be doing in the future, they'll, who knows what numbers, okay? But what they're living on now, and they make a decision. They might make the decision, hmm, <laughs> it's tough, you know, I, I couldn't really live very well on that. That's telling them they need to buy more selfies. They've reaffirmed what their goal is. 30 is not enough. By the way, you can have a goal and you can change it, just like your travel agent. You came to New York today, if you're not from New York, but you could have changed it to London and your agent would do it for you. Same thing here, but let's not get off on that side point. Okay, so do you understand two things from this? To decide how many selfies they would hope for or aspire to, you saw what it took. Very intuitive. To judge where you are in the process, in 5, 10, 15, or 20 years, you saw what it took. You just look at how much you will get, and you make the decision, how would I like living that way, or how would I think I would like? That is understandable by everyone, okay? So this goes to the question of information. You're all aware with DC plans and others, one of the big challenges, they say, financial education. How are everybody, including my brilliant 150 IQ, three PhD nanotechnology colleagues at MIT, when they get, as we have to give them, the history of 650 mutual funds, what are they supposed to do with that? They don't know, okay? So this is about giving people information. Instead of having them to learn and get educated, you turn it around. What do they know how to do and are comfortable with doing design the product to work with that, rather than try to get the people who are buying to learn how to do what you're, the way you look at it. If you think of it that way, no, none of the fancy phones and things you buy today work if you have to go through the manual. In fact, they don't even give you the manual, they give you a, a website if you really want to look it up. I'm saying we ought to do at least that with retirement. So design it for what people know how to do rather than say, how can we educate them to be financial engineers and understand compound interest and projections of inflation and risk return frontiers and asset allocations and all of that sort of thing. That's the spirit of this, okay? And so you see, this does address the issue of financial literacy. That's all the person needs, but let me go on and show you more. I wanna show you the two features. Somebody will say, oh, you know, we have tips. Why tips? Because that's inflation protected. Remember, it's a standard of living we're shooting for, not a nominal income. So at least tips, right? Hey, we have 30-year tips. Isn't that good enough? 
you know, it's not perfect, but good enough. If you're a bond trader, and I see a few in this room, you know how to trade 30-year tips to replicate or approximate any payoff you want. Very good for you. Are we going to have people sub high school or even our, my colleagues at MIT doing dynamic trading in tips to try to match the cash flows they want uh, for the re in retirement? I don't think so. Okay? So this picture, if you can see it, is designed to show you the left side is what you get if you buy the selfie. These are the picture of payments. You see no payment out, no payments till 2058, and then a level set of payments, all right, starting in 2058. On the right side is the longest dated 30-year tip. What payments do you get? Every six months you get a coupon, don't you? In 40 years, that's 80 coupons. Well, of course, there isn't a 40-year bond, so in the 30 years, it's 60 coupons. Then what happens at the end of the 30 years? You get a lump sum payment, right? So look at what our 25-year-old, 20, our 26-year-old has to do with sell tips. Every six months has to do something with the coupon. We hope reinvest it and not spend it, because <laughs> it won't be there for retirement. Secondly, if they decide to, what do they buy? Third, there are costs. They have to take off time from work, from their family, do something, and you know if there are small amounts, probably the transaction cost to them for the amount that they do is probably going to be pretty crummy. But it's more than just the transaction cost of the spreads or whatever. It's the time and having to figure out what the hell to do with the money. 60 times in 30 years, 80 times in 40 years. Do you, you see the... Uh, when, that's a lot of work, a lot of costs, a lot of decisions. So what I wanted to do with this picture is to say the difference between a selfie and, you know, a, a tip that we have is big for this purpose. They're not going to do those trades. If they do, they're going to be very friction, very friction. So that's why we made it very carefully that way. The second one is, what did I index it to. Well, since it's standard living, you think inflation. But no, that's not what we chose. We chose to index it to per capita consumption. Why per capita consumption? What have we promised them in retirement? A standard living that they enjoyed in the latter part of their work life, not the standard living they have now. If we protect them against inflation only, what are we assuming? No change in standard of living for the next 10, 20, 30, or 40 years. Ask yourself introspectively, would you like to have the standard of living you had 40 years ago if you're up to 40? Otherwise, go back to where you are. Ken, remember? You want the cell phone that you had? There wasn't cell phones at that time, right? So that's not doing it. Inflation is not good enough. The beauty of per capita consumption is, first, it captures the, the inflation measure that matters, consumption, not the GDP deflator, not the producer price index, which is totally irrelevant to someone who wants to retire. So we're getting consumption inflation, but what else are we getting? Improvements or decreases, but improvements in standard of living. And we don't have to separate the two. We get a two for it. It's just per capita consumption. So those are the two. Now for Korea, just to give you numbers, so you understand I'm not talking about little round off errors. What I've computed here for the last 10 years, last 20, last 30, and then all the way back to when modern Korea started to take off as, you know, as, as a country uh, economically, 1965. And the last column, this breaks down per capita growth of consumption and breaks it into inflation and standard of living. And the last column says, if you just had inflation protection, which by the way, not everybody gets at all. That's in Vanguard, right? <laughs> you know, to protect people from inflation in their pensions. How far are you behind? In 10 years in Korea, you're 13% behind the, where your goal was because of standard of living. 20 years, you're 36 behind, cent behind. In other words, you get 64% of what you would get if you had both. And of course, if, I, I'm even gonna go to the long one. The point here from this picture, which I can then easily show you, 
here why is standard of living is matters. It's not round off air. And I don't think that the assumption of just inflation is a flat standard of living. That's Korea's standard of living. That's real per capita consumption. Does that look flat? Now, Korea's had a very good run. But if you do Singapore, it looks different, but similar. Hong Kong, similar. Now, this is not likely to be what Korea will do in the next 40 or 50 years. And what Singapore did isn't likely to be. And what Hong Kong did isn't likely to be. But if you look at the cross section of those countries, that gives you some idea of how much variation you might have in the next 50 years. You may end up having Korea looking like Singapore, or you might have and leave aside any other kinds of countries. So by looking at that, I want you to see two things. Standard of living is not round off that you can say good enough as an approximation. It's not close to the goal. And secondly, it's not forecastable in any meaningful way, in certainly long horizons. So it's a real risk, and it's a risk that people bear. By giving them per capita consumption, we take both those off the table. Now go back to, remember when I said the advice to our 26 year old, look at what you're making now, that should be your, tell you how many selfies you need. How could that be? That's 40 years from now. Maybe they're gonna be, you know, things will be very different. Well, if I use their, if, I, if the payments on these selfies were nominal, that would be a stupid thing, right? I mean, you wouldn't. But I've got, not only do I have inflation, but I have standard of living. And this is for working middle class. If you've ever looked at the profile of earning, yeah, you go from, uh, like assistant professors, you go from you know, uh, pre apprentice, journeyman, master. So there's a, a slope. But after that, if you take out general standard of living and inflation, it's pretty flat. Now, is it perfect? No. But what I'm saying is, if you give them standard, general standard of living and general I mean, and CPI inflation, which is, of course, no one's precise bundle. That's pretty close. Remember, someone doing otherwise has to forecast. And this room knows what forecasts of standard of living, stock prices, interest rates are, not for 40 years from now, for next year. And I have plenty of data to show you in the real world of the United States. The idea that, like, you know, in the long run, everything's 4%, so you don't have to worry about it. That's not true. Confronted with the data, that's some world, not the world we have lived in, maybe the world of the future, but unlikely. And just so here. I want to confront it as MIT, the scientific, confront ideas or statements or narratives with facts of data. I know that's not terribly popular in every part of the United States today, but here I hope that the idea is you are confronted with the actual data. All right, so that's Singapore. Now, so, let me just, before I move into who will use the sources of selfies, and this gets the second part of my story, all right, let's review. Our person comes in, 26 years old, 10th grade education. When do you want to retire? We've got to get that number. Not too hard, but maybe they can get some advice if they don't know. All right, 2058. All right, buy the 2858 selfie. Okay. That's what they have to do. Second, how many selfies would you aspire to? We went through that, 5,000. And we saw how we did that calculation. How are we doing along the way? We did that. Now let's look at what this person does after they buy a selfie. They buy the selfie. Do they have to do anything until when? They don't have to do anything until 2058. They get no payments. There's nothing to reinvest. There's no decision to make. There's nothing. It's exactly like a pension. You put your money in a pension, NPS in Korea or whatever. So you, know, you don't do anything, and then it comes out when you retire. Well, the same thing with a selfie. So once you've bought it, and I told you the information you need to buy it intelligently, I mean, not just, OK, you do nothing. Until when? 2058. Now, big decision, right? Guess what? If that person actually retires in, 19, in, in 2058, as planned, they don't have to do anything either. Why? What do they get? 
exactly the kind of payments that they want, a stream of income for, let's say, 20 or 25 years. And we'll come back to the longevity. So what do we see from this? Other than the initial purchase, the information they need to make that purchase is very minimal, something that's reasonable for people to understand. They can relate to it. It's their current income. Okay. They have no decisions to make, no transactions to make till they retire. And when they retire, they have nothing to do because they're going to start getting a stream of payments, which are exactly the payments that they want to get. So they don't even have to trade again. I don't think there's anything that I've seen that minimizes not just transaction costs in the usual sense, but thinking costs, decision costs, taking time off from work, family, or something else to do these problems. All of us love that. That's one of the reasons people like pensions. This fits that. Approximations to this, as soon as you start approximating to these characteristics, you make life complicated. Complicated in understanding, complicated in explaining, complicated in execution. Now, I want to say right up front, I'm not suggesting that this is the nirvana for this problem. I want you to see it as a floor. I've showed it to you. I know that if you put your heads together and start thinking about it, or in particular countries, you can improve on it. This is a minimum, not, not the answer. It's a answer, but it's not bad in dealing with the addressed issues. So that's in terms of its functionality. But now we discovered, you know, and I told you, we were laser focused on solving this problem for this group of people who can do this in any country where they have some kind of a government bond market. Just the mechanics of doing this, all right? Now look who would actually be the users. Well, they're the people that are not covered, not part of the official sector, or don't, just don't have any kind of pension. That's who it was designed for. Who else? I already mentioned it. You're a member of the National Pension Service in Korea. You've got a full pension except it's 41% replacement. Maybe you'd like more like 80 or 70. So now you set a goal for the top up. That's where you take on responsibility above the government provided one. So you have your pension and this is to enhance it to a level that's livable. In your mind, it's a good, a good pension. So that's the one. Who else are going to be doing that? Everybody in the DC plan. Now you're in the DC plan. They say, what do you want? And what do you want to invest in? Well, you see, this is a, at least for the risk-free part. On the matter of risk-free and risky, we take risk in pension design, in retirement solution, because we can't get what we want or would like to have without taking risk. In other words, if we do everything risk-free, we, we just don't have enough resources to be able to do it. That is why you take risk. Not because someone says everybody should hold 20% at risk when they're 65. Why? I don't know. That seems like a good number. Risk is not something we voluntarily want to take. That's why we call it risk. But you took a risk this morning to come here and listen to me and my colleagues. Probably my colleagues is a better idea. OK? No, if you really wanted to be safe, you would have stayed at home, didn't take a risk coming here. So you, over time, every one of us makes risk return change offs. So risk isn't bad, but you wouldn't have done it unless you saw a reason you wanted to do it. You wouldn't just take the risk and say, hey, wahoo, unless you're looking for some kind of uh, you know, charge from taking risk that's meaningless. OK? So I'm just reminding you of that. And the same thing is here. Selfies are designed first to deal with the non-risky part, but it also takes some of the reason why we take risk off the table. How many of you who have been involved give advice that says, well, you better hold some stocks because you know, standard pension benefits are either not protected for inflation. Of course, you could say, well, now we have tips. You know, your stocks aren't really that good a hedge against inflation. Pretty noisy. But, you know, if you got nothing, it's a real asset at least, or real estate or timber or whatever. They're all proxies. Tips give you exactly what you want. So the, I don't buy this argument that inflation is a reason for holding stocks. But standard living, you might say, hey, if standard living goes up, stocks should go up. That's a pretty good association, you hope. Okay. Now, of course, we don't see that they're perfectly correlated. Just look at the last two years. But okay, that's an editorial. Um, but you know, if you think about it, by giving them standard of living, you actually take off the table much of the reason people want to take risk. Now, if they're not saving enough, they still have to take risk. They do it in the old-fashioned way, where we do it now. They take some of their money and put it at risk, let's say, in stocks. But when they buy something for the, quote, risk-free asset, what should be in target date funds should be selfies, 
That's really, what's in target date funds will make your socks roll. It's the worst asset you could almost invest in in retirement. It's a two-year note. That's for another, class, another discussion, okay? I'm just trying to give you state of the art. By the way, the selfies have kind of the flavor of target date funds except for real. Target date funds tell you 2040. You think, oh, when I give me, I glide in and I have the right amount of money. No, when you get to 2040, they're still gonna have half your money in stocks. Why? They don't tell you. Look at the prospectus. They tell you what they will do, they don't tell you why or what the goal is. I'm not picking on them, they just happen to be the standard of the moment. So that's now versus what we're talking about. But if you had selfies, think about it. You're getting the standard of living that you want. Isn't that getting you pretty close to that goal that you all agreed of, of getting the standard of living? I'm going to have, if I save enough, and not astronomically necessarily a much, but you at least know. Okay, so the DC plan. But who else is going to buy these? Institutions. If there's anyone in the room who's involved with a pension fund, what are your liabilities? A whole bunch of payments, maybe if lucky protected for inflation, ideally it would be at least, but you've made a whole bunch of commitments to pay to people in the future, right? What's the best hedge asset? Well, tips, well, if it's real, well, not bad, but you remember it's not exactly a perfect tracker because it doesn't have the right maturities and it makes a lot of payments and there's a lot of reinvestment risk, et cetera, right? But you know, that's what you do as professionals. But imagine you could buy a selfie. And what you would do is, you would look at the profile of your pension fund, not some hypothetical pension fund, not some average pension fund profile, yours. You look at the actual people in it, their profile, and you can buy selfies, not for each one of them individually, but collectively for the exposure that the fund has, actually has, not some hypothetical fund. It's a size 11 shoe. You know, there are people in the audience here, yep, I see, that wear a US size six shoe. And I know there are people in the audience who wear a US size 12 shoe. How about on average? On average would be we all turn on our shoes when you leave today and get a size nine. Think how that one works. Or my head's in the oven, my feet in the refrigerator. On average, the temperature's pretty good, right? I'm reminding you, and particularly among older people, okay, the degree of variation of what you need in retirement is actually very wide, not very sim narrow. It isn't that we all want to sit there and watch the grass grow. Some of us are very healthy, robust, have lots of commitments. Some of us, sadly, are not very well, wouldn't want to buy an annuity because, frankly, we know that we're sick or have other things that live it. Some of us have no responsibility for anyone but ourselves. Actually, when you get to retirement age, you're the most dispersed group of people I can find. All of us were the same when we were 20, male and female. Our skin was all good, our joints all worked. None of us, unless we were Olympic gold medalists, had actually achieved anything, but some of us had won, you know, most likely to succeed. We, of course, know those aren't the people who succeeded, but, you know, basically we all look the same. But think of that cohort in your own life, 10 years later, 20 years later, spread out, did not narrow. Okay, so what this allows you to do, if you happen, sadly, something happens to our 25-year-old before he gets to retirement, or she does, it's a bond. It goes to people. It's not lost. I don't have to explain, by the way, you'll lose your money if you don't get to, it's not a pension. It's a pension substitute by creating the pattern. Last, as I'm looking at this, is who do it. So as an institutional investor, this is a dream for you. And you can improve performance. Why? When you don't have the right risk-free asset to match your liabilities for the risk-free part of the portfolio. Let's not worry about you taking risk. It's okay, individuals are what? Consciously taking risk in the market to try to get more, fine. I'm talking about the risk-free part of the portfolio. And when you can't hold the risk-free asset, what do you have to do? You have to hold a reserve as a cushion to make sure you can pay it. If you're an insured company, you understand what reserves are, and I don't mean accounting reserves. You have more money than you think you need because what you expect to happen may not happen. You don't have a match. The selfie matches you perfectly. Therefore, you can get rid of reserves. That means you can dedicate less of the resources of the individual and the whole pension fund to reserves 
that's not productive in the sense that you don't put them at risk when you want to, okay? And if you take all risk off the table, I'm not saying you should, you can do it with less than the reserves, right? Because if you have a perfect match to the payments, you don't need reserves. And this leads me to the other part. Remember I said we're all going to be, well, most of you, I've always, I say, I'm past expiration date, okay? So if you all, if you all uh, think about when you get to retirement, suppose you're holding selfies. Now, the selfies, let's say, are going to pay for 22 years. We've had to pick a number. Let's pick 22. Now, why did I pick 22 rather than 15 or 40? Well, of course, the more payments, the more expenses it's going to be to buy a selfie, right? If you get a selfie starting in 2058 and it makes 40 payments, you pay more for that than for 20 payments. If you don't need 40 payments, you're overpaying. That's inefficient for our... On the other hand, if you buy five payments, <laughs> you're going to run out, very likely. So what's the right amount? Suppose you get to retirement, you have nobody that's dependent on you, you don't care about leaving anything else, you've gifted everything to your family and to MIT, so you no longer have, you know, you don't need any more uh, needs. So you would just carry, with you. so you don't want to leave anything. Anything you leave is wasted. So obviously an annuity would be a good idea. If we're very clever, the years we pick for the selfie, we can make life really simple for that person. Because that person then says, oh, I see my situation now, and 22 years is a long time, but I might live 30. What am I going to do for the other eight years? Oh, I better have to save for that. No, I can't give anything away. To, I, the house, nothing. Can't give it away because I might need those assets. But you can have it when I no longer need it. And that's great for that 39-year-old with two kids, 9 and 11, <coughs> maximum consumption, that they'll know that maybe if it's 30 years from now, they'll be 69 when they get this wonderful legacy. Anyway, okay? What do we do? We take the selfie, we go to his insurance company. He's a well-run insurance company. He understands diversification of longevity across sexually, you know, across groups. So the per the 20, that 20, previous 25-year-old might live one day of 40 years. You know, as all the good books wishes, may you live to 120. That's a big risk for that person, right? But for the insurance company, what do you get from diversification? Very minimal risk. So what if we set the selfie payments at just somewhat larger than ex life expectancy conditional on getting to, say, age 65? Then every well-run insurance company would be happy to swap a annuity that will pay you forever, as long as you need money, no matter what you live to, for the same payments on your selfie per year, $10 per month. And they're willing to do the swap. Why? Because they've diversified away the risk that none of us can do. We have a big personal risk. Insurance companies have very little personal risk, uh, risk because of diversification. That's how it's supposed to work. Why I picked that? Because if you were expecting to get, you had your 5,000 slow fees, you were expecting to get 50,000 a year. And I say, well, if you want to be protected for life, you're going to, have to pay for that means either you get less than 50,000 in the annuity, uh, you know, that you buy, or you have to come up with some more money. Where do you get that? You didn't plan on it. Psychologically, that's terrible. But if it's just, oh, you decided you're worried about how long you're going to live. That's a big deal. You want an annuity for some amount or all? Just hand yourself into the insurance company, and they hand you back something, and it pays exactly the amount of what was being paid on the selfie for the rest of your life. I'm trying to go through this detail, not because this is a workshop, but to give you a flavor that this isn't a 50,000 feet, here's an idea, throw it up on the wall, and let them people figure it out. I'm saying once you start to do this, you see all the pieces can be put together to make something that works because you start from the premise, you're trying to do that, solve a problem for a group of people, and that includes designing it so they don't have to do anything that they're not used to doing. Give them choice, but give them meaningful choice. Choice that they can understand, choice of what matters to them, choice as to what's about them that's important. Probably the least important in practical sense is the differences in risk aversion. When you put people at the same income level and middle class, working class, I'm not talking, 
Introspection doesn't work in this room, because if you're in finance, it's probably the highest paid, least legal profession in the world, okay? <laughs> so say, oh, I wouldn't do that. This isn't for you. This is for the vast bulk of people in the world, which are defined as working and middle class. The very poor you have to deal with differently? Absolutely, that's a separate discussion. And those above middle class, I'm not worried about. You can use the same technology, and some of them will use it. Maybe you're very wealthy, you wanna give an annuity to some second cousin you're responsible for as the patriarch of your family, you buy selfies for them, leave it at that. So I'm not saying it can't be used elsewhere, but we're solving a particular problem. Last point, because I've only got 21 seconds and I wanted to make it, why should government be the issuer? And here's the quick list. What made this simple? When I tell them to buy the selfies, no risk. If I said, well, this is what's been promised to you, but of course, you know, and then SEC style, you go on for pages <laughs> explaining risk. You, this is to anybody, including us, but can you imagine doing this with somebody with a 10th grade education? It just doesn't work. I always treat governments as risk-free, even if they may default, because it, I believe it's a joke for, at least unless you move your money offshore or do some things that, the rest, most of us can't do, even if we wanted to. Once the government is in default, all the rules of the game are changed. They can tax anything they want, they can take anything you want. So it's a joke to say, well, if I hold private sector stocks or bonds, I'll be okay. Not when the government's default. It's broken its promises in a big way. So I always treat government promises, even in countries that are not AAA. So that's the risk. Oops, I've run out. Well, I didn't even give you any Q&A, sorry. But quickly, you need a real, if this is gonna be one of the cornerstones of retirement for people, you have to have a reliable supplier. In good times and bad, people retire all the time. Government's about the best you can do on that side. Governments always need to borrow money, right? The third one is, we know, why doesn't the private sector produce this? Because you've gotta hedge the promise of per capita consumption. How do I do that? What asset do I buy? I don't know any asset like that. What about government? It has that asset, it's called a VAT, not in the United States yet, but in most other countries. VAT tax, I remind you, is a consumption tax. The revenues are consumption. In fact, if you're in a country where you don't touch trust accounting, I won't mention which ones, what do you do? Instead of indexing the selfies to per capita consumption measured by the national income accounts, you index it to the revenues of VAT divided by the tax rate. Governments don't like to minimize cash revenues and it's very hard to hide them and play with them. I mean, if you're doing that, you've got a much bigger problem with the government. So there are ways to take care of the accounting and all that, which we've dealt with with CPI already, but I'm just saying that could be handled too, even in some of the roughest countries in that regard out there. So they're a natural issuer. Finally, uh, if you're interested in debt stability, if your domestic holders of, of, of debts are domestic, that's a much more stable than if you have foreigners holding a debt. This creates an enormous pool of domestically held money. Of what maturity? 10, 20, 30, 40 years, no payments. That's a very stable funding. Finally, uh, for those who want to get a, a lower price, I would just mention, if this completes markets, makes life easier for institutions and so forth, people will pay a premium price a lower interest rate. You can also reduce government funding. So if you don't have any use for the money, just retire the debt you have now and use these, okay? And finally, that I didn't plan on it. How many people have heard funding infrastructure? Big deal, maybe even in this country. What's the problem with funding infrastructure, particularly if you're not a AAA plus country? No payments from the infrastructure for 10 years, 15 years. Then you get the payoff. What's the funding look like? 10-year bonds at max? Coupon bonds? So when you borrow the money, you don't only have to borrow money for the project, you gotta borrow money to pay back to the same people you, you borrowed it from in coupons. That sounds really sensible. And if the project is longer <laughs> before it starts producing money than the other, you have to roll that debt. Anyone who's ever dealt with countries that are less than AAA plus understand roll risk is very meaningful. You can end up on infrastructure projects, and you've seen them in certain parts of the world, half-finished airports because they can't roll the financing to continue it. 
Selfies are perfectly matched to that. And you don't have to bribe anybody. Bond traders in the room, if I came to you and said, I want you, and I'm not picking on it, I want you to buy 40 year, a, a 2058 selfie bond of Malaysia. That means no payments for 40 years, and then 20 more payments promised after that. You'd all laugh at me and you'd say, we won't do that. Or some hedge fund might say, we'll do one <laughs> at seven, 700 basis points risk premium. OK, that won't work. Why? Because I'm not selling them to bond buyers, except maybe in, in pension funds. I'm selling them to people, and people love these payments. I don't have to bribe them. They say thank you. Well, with that, I think I've run over my time. Thank you very much, but I thought it was kind of cool. One simple thing, you realize this is a government bond. There's nothing very radical about it. No tenure for this one, okay? But we dealt with several problems. We focused on funding retirement for those who don't have it. We've expanded and show there's a whole bunch of users. I didn't even mention Doug Breeden, a MIT graduate's consumption asset pricing model in which he showed that it's not the market portfolio that's the best diversified portfolio to use in all your strategies. It's a portfolio of holding an asset that's perfectly correlated with consumption. I think selfies fits that. So actually selfies will be of interest to all investors having nothing to do with retirement. So, we solved a whole bunch, or at least addressed a whole bunch of policy issues. Infrastructure, debt stability, cost of debt financing, da, da, da. Not bad for one. Thank you for your time. I apologize to Antoinette.